Hello and welcome everyone to She Inspires virtual round table on inspiring the next generation of women leaders presented by HCL Technologies. HCL is proud to be associated with International Women's Day voicing out its position in raising awareness against bias, celebrating women's achievements and encouraging its employees to help create a gender equal workplace, an equal world. Aiming to break barriers and encourage more women to challenge the stereotypes, we gather here today to hear the life stories of women who have blazed a trail in leadership roles, who are inspiring the next generation of women leaders who decided to choose to challenge. Hosting this conversation will be Neha Anand, Global Head of Content, Digital and Thought Leadership at HCL Technologies. She is also the Managing Editor for Street Talk. Within the services industry, Neha has a wide range of experience working in hospitality, aviation, consulting, education and IT. Welcome Neha. Thank you. Without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Mayor Bonnie Crombie. Since first being elected as mayor in 2014, Mayor Crombie has worked diligently to improve the quality of life for Mississauga residents by holding the line on taxes, investing in improving traffic congestion, promoting an agenda of sustainability and resiliency which includes building regionally connected transit and attracting major economic investment, all while managing the growth of Canada's sixth largest city. Welcome, Mayor Crombie. Welcoming our second panelist, Angela Sim, Senior Vice President, Engineering and Technology Operations at Bank of Montreal. She leads a diverse team of over 1,900 resources, unifying technical and business teams and simplifying PMO's capabilities to achieve PMO's strategic goals. Welcome, Angela. Welcoming our third panelist, Lynn Emanuel, who is the Vice President of Infrastructure Technology Global Services at BD. She has over 35 years of experience working in three major industries, airlines, computer distribution, and medical technologies. She has been with BD for the past 19 years and progressed through various roles. Welcome, Lynn. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcoming our fourth panelist, Stella Tucker, Executive Vice President for Corporate Development and Strategic Initiatives at HCL Technologies. She leads the company's inorganic growth efforts and key strategic initiatives through sourcing, evaluating, and executing acquisitions, mergers, joint ventures, minority investments, carve outs, and partnerships around the world. Welcome, Stella. I would like to thank all the panelists Hi, for joining thank us you. today and taking time to share their perspectives. For those watching, please leave your questions in the comment section below as our speakers will be responding to select queries at the end of the session. Over to you, Neha. Thank you so much, uh, Apurva. And really a warm, warm welcome to each of our panelists here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think all our viewers uh, are really looking forward uh, you know, to those nuggets of stories coming from each of you and uh, you know the in inspirational experiences that you'll share with us today. So really, again, a warm welcome. Uh, and I'll straight away, I know we have just 60 minutes and there's just so much to talk about on this special day and this special month of uh, you know, women's, uh, women's Day. Uh, I'm going to really kind of uh, start with the first question, you know, with, with the high profile portfolios that you know, each of you manage, uh, Mayor Crombie managing an entire city uh, you know, Angela, 
you're managing an entire, uh, you know, the IT operations for Bank of Montreal, Lynn, uh, you know, the medical technology, uh, IT operations for BD, uh, and Stella, the, the corporate development uh, for one of the fastest growing technology companies. So all of you with such high uh, profiles, uh, you know, how has it been like the last 12 months? I mean, this, this pandemic has touched each of us, each of our lives, each of our families, our environments. How have you been able to uh, cope up with it? What is it that has worked for you? Uh, you know, I think that would be something we'd like to start with to understand your journey uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, so, Madam Mayor, I'll, I'll start with you um, <clears throat> to hear from you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you again for having me today. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> the past one year has been like none other. It's certainly been a blip in time. Uh, I'm trying to think of it's so unprecedented what it could compare to maybe the experiences people had during World War One or Two. You know, when time had stopped and all the focus was on resolution of conflict, and now we're on resolution of a global pandemic. So uh, it's been very troubling. It's been very difficult to manage priorities. Um, I felt very strongly that uh, you know we wanted our businesses to succeed, but wanted the safety and well-being of our residents, of course. Um, what I saw throughout was such a resilience in the community, particularly the spirit of Mississauga really shone bright. People stepping up to help each other, whether it was to sew masks, prepare meals, deliver groceries, call seniors, whatever it was, people were there for each other. And it was so inspiring. Nonetheless, we saw a lot of businesses shutter, close their doors perhaps forever. Many of these uh, were female led businesses. Um, uh, I found it very concerning that I heard that one in four women uh, were thinking about scaling back their careers as a result of the global pandemic. Uh, we know always that women have the bigger burden of home care, child care, parent care, but now even, even more so during the pandemic when many children are take ed being educated online from home. Well, how do you manage your job, your career, and, and your children while everyone is at home together? It must be very, very difficult. So women are talking about scaling back their careers. And then when I think about the businesses that are shuttered, many of them are personal care services, which are led by women, whether they're hair, nail salons, spa businesses, those are all run by women, women who are supporting families. Even in restaurants, you see many women are, are running, operating, uh, or working in restaurants. And these are the kinds of businesses that have been hit the hardest. So of course, um, that's where my concern is. Um, what could have helped? Other than, other than opening, um, certainly more financial support from levels, different levels of government to stay stable uh, and, and childcare, you know, stable childcare uh, for those women. And how did we all manage? I don't know. <laughs> Every day becomes the same, one screen to another, or WebEx to a Zoom call to Teams. Um, I, you know, I'm blessed to live with my daughter, who is also a, a professional. She's a consultant, public sector consultant. And, you know, we were both working together side by side. And it was, excuse me, I'm on a call. Could you keep it down? I'm sorry, I need to tape a video. Could you keep it down? <laughs> so I had to, you know, I had to um, clean out a bedroom and make it my office. And we survived so that we could get some separation from each other. And we survived because we were there for each other, certainly, you know, helping maintain each other's personal care <laughs> and working out together, we would exercise and we were joined a gym, but then those closed too. So we did them online together and uh, hikes wherever possible. And whatever you can do for your mental health is so important and physical health. So any nice day, take a walk in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, on the trails and working out as often as we could, a couple, two, three times a week too. So that's where we were, I think, and uh, I hope that helps. Hope yes. I didn't take too long. Thanks, thanks for sharing long. that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Mayor Kambi. Uh, Angela, you want to share something from the last 12 months and how did you balance uh, you know, your professional life and your personal life? For sure. 
Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here with this esteemed group of women. And I I always think that I have a really hard job and then I hear Mayor Crombie and I'm like, oh, my <laughs> life is much easier compared to protecting a whole city. So hats off to you, Mayor Crombie, of keeping us safe. And I would say COVID has been really hard. Um, what I've seen through COVID is people are rising above. There's amazing stories of strength and perseverance and courage. Uh, but I would say, if you ask me personally, I would say I've managed through, but I haven't sailed through. Um, you know, I'm a mom, I have a nine year old and a 13 year old, and I'm also a full time employee and I have a really, I'll call it a stressful and important job. And um, like, like many of you, you're trying to balance the mom and the working at home. And uh, I also love people. So being at home for a year has almost uh, killed me. <laughs> and so part of that has been, how do I keep myself, I'll call it emotionally well. So I would say the 12 months has been really hard. I think hats off to everyone who's gone through that. You could be a mother of really long, young children. Like I often say to my team, I don't know how you do it. Some people with five-year-olds and two-year-olds and their balancing work is so hard. And then you look at the flip side, you have a lot of single women who don't have a strong support system who may be isolated, who can't interact with the people they usually get to interact with. And I think this has been unbelievably hard. And so what I would say is uh, the last 12 months has been a chance to grow. <laughs> Personally, uh, as a leader, as a mom, uh, it's really given me a chance to rebalance what I think is important in life. What's my work-life balance mean to me? What does having it all truly mean to me? And really, I would say focusing on mental and physical health through exercise and just chatting with friends and also just reaching out to those in need. So part of this is, you know, I look at people who have been so amazing in supporting their community, and I would say, keep going. Uh, I feel like we're almost there. I know we're many, many months away, but I feel like we almost have the light at the end of the tunnel. And women specifically, uh, to Mayor Crombie's point, still typically do bear the brunt of a lot of, I'll call it child rearing and other home activities. And so the ask is, you know, I would say as a community, whether or not you're a woman or a man, let's bond together and let's enable our teams and let's help those around us. Great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, um, Angela. Lynn, over to you for your thoughts on that. <laughs> sure. I had a lot of uh, similar thoughts and um, conversation items that I wanted to touch on that have already been shared by Angela and Bonnie. And again, thanks for letting me join this session today. I'm very honored. I think, you know, without a doubt, it's been a real challenge this year. Um, I consider myself fortunate. I have, you know, two wonderful daughters. They're older, though. They have their own careers. Although we were all working together, uh, sometimes in the house, the whole family's home with the dogs and all kinds of things going on. It's been a, a little bit of a mental challenge just to cry, make sure that you can stay focused on what you need to do. Um, and also kind of just, you know, walking through and making sure that everybody else has what they need as they're trying to get through the day. Um, I traveled a lot uh, prior to kind of COVID. So I've been home for the last over just over a year now. Um, so I was very much used to not being home all the time. So then all of a sudden, 365 days being home, um, seven days a week, 24 hours being in the house has been a big adjust adjustment for me. Um, and I think just that loss of the casual conversations and the face to face with people um, and just being on a screen like this every day kind of going from seven to seven um, is not the same experience. I think mentally for, for, for me and a lot of other women, I think we like to have that face-to-face -face conversation, the casual chat. It feels strange to have to book time to catch up with people. I think that's been something that I've struggled with um, because everybody's day is just so full. Um, so I think, you know, mental and mental health, I think that's been mentioned a couple of times, making sure you're reaching out to people, um, and checking on others to make sure they're okay. Um, and also sharing your stories and how you're feeling has been very important, I think, as we go through, um, you know, the remainder of this lockdown and hopefully kind of come out the other end um, with new learnings around what it's like to be, you know, in a house with a bunch of folks. I think it's also challenged me to think about what's important. So does it really matter if somebody hears a dog barking in the background? Probably not. So my level of, you know, perfection and trying to control everything is probably less than it was before, which I think has been a good growth for me. Um, and, you know, sharing that with others and seeing other people's family walk through the background while you're in meetings has brought a bit, a little bit of, you know, home life back into the work life, which I think has been a nice balance and you get to see the other side of people. 
So while it's been challenging, I think there's been some positive things that we've started to, to see that, you know, there's a lot of other things going on with people than just what you see when you're sitting in a meeting day after day. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn, for sharing that. Stella, your thoughts? Your yeah, experience? no, um, I think everyone's kind of said it. I, I think how I've gotten through the, the last 12 months, and I, I, I think I have you know, measured success <laughs> uh, in what I've been able to do. And I think part of it is just staying on task. Um, and it really forces you to just kind of fo focus on what you absolutely need to get done and try to deprioritize the stuff that uh, will just occupy every minute of every day. Because what I have found is that the pandemic has uh, filled out my calendar. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm, I run Corp Dev globally. So I, I'm starting, call, you know, people are just scheduling calls anywhere from 6 a.m. till, you know, one in the morning. Um, and because, uh, as Lynn mentioned, there's no casual conversations. We don't pick up the phone. We, we actually are constantly putting calendar invites out there. Um, I found through the first part of this past year, I've <laughs> literally just on calls constantly. And I've done a better job trying to set those boundaries. And I think everyone probably has gone through the same thing. Um, I think the positive of it is, I used to probably travel 200,000 miles a year, um, yeah, both in my, uh, you know, less in my current role, but but certainly as an investment banker in the past. And I have four kids that uh, range in age from nine to 17. And so it has afforded me the opportunity to spend an inordinate amount of time with them. Uh, so the plus is I get to spend a ton of time with them. And then the downside is, oh my gosh, I'm spending a ton of time with them. And so uh, that's actually been a blessing in disguise. Um, and I do think that uh, what I've forgotten as I've kind of, you know, been on the road and, and been preoccupied professionally is how important it is to children that you spend that time together as a family. So that's been kind of the, the silver lining in all this. Um, and then the third point is I've done a terrible job separating my personal and professional life. I, I would say that's probably been throughout my career, but in particular uh, through the pandemic. I think that work has bled through into everything. Um, because you are stationary and because you are constantly accessible, because really, what are you doing on a Friday and Saturday night? You're at home quarantining. So that is something that I've learned um, uh, to try to, you know, exercise the power of no. But I still struggle with that on a day to day basis. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Stella. So some very good positives I hear here, uh, you know, from uh, Meg Crombie on how to build uh, more camaraderie with with your family <laughs> because you all are going to be staying in together for a long long time so, so i think great great positive point there uh angel now from from your end you know how how to write kind of introspect on balancing between uh you know uh your work and and your personal life and similarly stella from your end really introspecting and enjoying that time with family while we have it uh, you know, <clears throat> and, uh, and and Lynn, from your end, you know, how do you kind of build more tolerance for imperfections? So I think some some really good uh, positives um, from from each of you here. So as we go to the next question, uh, uh, and uh, and again, uh, Mayor Prambi, this is this is for you. Uh, you know, I understand uh, currently in Canada, uh, you know, you have uh, very few uh, women mayors. And then so, you know, you come from a kind of a male dominated sector. So your thoughts on, uh, you know, how the journey has been for you, you know, to be where you are today, you know, the success that you've been able to achieve, uh, you know, your learnings, uh, you know, and, and what you would like to share from that. Thank you. It's an interesting question. I just wanted to comment to Stella. Uh, that <laughs> exercising the power of no is very helpful when you're a bit bored and go down to the kitchen and open the fridge door as we've That's all right. gained a few COVID-19 pounds. It's about, <laughs> right. it's about 19 started pounds. exercising because, <laughs> oh no, too much banana bread. <laughs> it has given us the opportunity to spend a little more time at home. Uh, you know, when we're not on calls, you don't have to travel. I don't have to go to events. I go to so many events uh, every evening and every weekend so we're home gardening and cleaning cupboards and baking banana bread and eating way too much for sure um so success how did that look i have a very i'm polish by background and a very strong tradition of 
matriarchs that push push their young women very hard and so the power of education and success and they always define success as becoming a doctor lawyer engineer or accountant but somehow i fell i thought i'd go into law and somehow I don't know. I, I always felt I like disappointed them. I actually have a business background, uh, MBA, a director's degree. I was uh, I worked in marketing. Uh, I worked to start my career in advertising, and then went client side. Worked for McDonald's Corporation in the U.S. Worked for Walt Disney on the studio lot in L.A. Came back, did an MBA. Worked at Insurance Bureau of Canada because I always loved politics, and then left there and became an entrepreneur and one of the founders of something called Cargo Cosmetics. I got to say, when I had three kids, uh, it, it became too much to manage when they were all, you know, my daughter was four or five and my son was nine or 10 and my other son was, you know, 12 or 14. They're, they're all four years apart and their needs were so different and it just became so difficult to manage because we have a baby and, you know, a young, uh, you know, child in elementary school and then a preteen or teen. Uh, so I took, I stepped back, but is stepping back for me meant that I sat on boards and became manic about community involvement and consulting um, and be, I sat on every board and be kind of became known in the community as a problem solver. If you want it to happen, ask Bonnie Crombie. She, that woman seems to have her hand in everything. I was the vice chair of the panel on the arts looking for sustainable funding for the arts. I was raising money for the hospital to build the cancer center. I was on a couple of other boards and of course involved in kids at school and driving them around to activities and all while trying to keep myself Self busy and out of harm's way. And then uh, one of the parties, I'd been involved in politics all my life, but usually knocking on doors for other people. I never really saw myself as putting my own name on a ballot. I just like to influence change and influence people. And uh, I, I love a kind of a, an assertive personality in case you couldn't tell. And so I never really saw myself as that person. I thought who would vote for me, but when they were looking for candidates, uh, Liberal Party, which I was a former MP, they kind of tapped me on the shoulder and you have a business background, you're involved in the community, the kind of person we'd like to, you know, to see run as a candidate, would you consider it? And I thought, oh, heck no, I'll find the right man for you. I know a guy, he'll be perfect. You know, and they said, oh, no, no, we had, you know, we have men who's, experience pale in comparison to yours and yet you know they're asking for the world uh, all the support they need the writing they want and here you're saying oh no 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 not me you'll find you the right guy so you know stereotypes are, are long and hard in all our minds and anyway so i i did run became a member of parliament then i had a career change when the government fell. I really enjoyed that time, the awe and majesty of federal politics. There's nothing else like walking into the House of Commons in the center block, oh my God. You know, I felt like I was on a Disney lot again, but a fantastic opportunity. And when the government changed, uh, Hazel came to me in fact and said, uh, you should, you should join my council. One of her counselors had been elected federally and there was an open seat and they were gonna have a by-election. And I thought, well, you know, I love the federal work in Ottawa and I don't know if I like municipal politics. I never really thought about it because I, I came to politics through partisan politics, through party politics. I've always been involved in the Liberal Party. I'd met the father, El Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and he was my inspiration. And they believed in multiculturalism and the first minister of multiculturalism was Polish. And here was room for me in this party who believed in immigrants and I thought, wow, this is something. So here we are. And so I thought municipal politics, that's interesting. So on the last day I registered and there were 26 other people and I was the 27th and uh, my colleague and good friend Carolyn Parrish was on that ballot too. She still can't believe I beat her. <laughs> we joke about it all the time, so not to worry. Uh, and I won and I got on council and it, soon thereafter Hazel wanted to retire and we had a number of accomplishments you know, being engaged in the community and building a new business improvement area, creating hockey leagues for underprivileged kids. Anyways, we did a lot for the community. And she said, you know, you should think about running for mayor when I retire. And I said, me? Me? I'm going back to Ottawa. I'm a member of parliament, remember? And she said, no, I think you should. So when somebody like Hazel McCallion, who is an inspiration to everyone, including me, of course, my mentor, my friend, you know, says you can do her job, that's something you take seriously, right? So uh, she was right, I did that and I 
I, I put a team together and when she retired, ran for mayor and here we are, I got elected a second time, reelected and I think my name will be on the ballot next October too. So hopefully all will go well with this pandemic and we'll all come through the other side and there will be elections again one day. But goodness, yeah, she's such an inspiration to us all. So between my, I know you're gonna ask me later, in sources of inspiration. I think our mothers are always the source of inspiration who keep the families together through thick and thin, no matter what the finances are, no matter what their own personal health conditions are. And then of course there's somebody like Hazel who never saw a barrier she didn't want to, you know, run over and break. <laughs> <laughs> and started so young. And of course, I am one of uh, three, by the way, three big city mayors in Canada. There's a, a group of us, we call ourselves big city mayors of Canada, and there are 23 of us so that it balances a little more evenly across the country, not too Ontario dominated. And there are only three of us, myself, Val Plant from Montreal and Long Guy, uh, Sylvie Perron. Uh, you know, if you look at Ontario, the Ontario big city mayors, there's a few more, but in Canada, not too many, not too many, right? So it is, uh, it's a male world. That's it's a great thing. achievement, uh, uh, Max. <laughs> I think it's a great achievement and such a big example for so many others Thank who you. want to be there. So so really, really Thank great you. to hear that story from you. And, and we'll come back because I'd love to know from you, you know, were there any, any gender biases you faced, uh, you know, while you, <laughs> we'll, come, we'll come back to that. Uh, but before that, maybe, um, Angela, any thoughts? I know, uh, in fact, uh, yourself, Lynn, Stella, all, all come from sectors which are more male dominated, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and you've all three been extremely successful. So, so what has been the mantra of success? How have you really climbed? What are the gender biases you faced? And, and how did you kind of overcome those? If you, you can put some thought on that and share with us. Sure. For sure, happy to speak to that. So I work for the Bank of Montreal, which is heavily in the financial sector. And in the financial sector, it still is a heavily male dominated environment for specific roles. Um, I would say in technology, it's typically worse and technology is very heavy, uh, heavily male dominated. And what I would say is I was either blessed or lucky or a mix of both that I, I started actually at a young age. I started 20 years ago at the Bank of Montreal. So I love hearing Mayor Crombie's different areas she worked in. In my case, this was my second job, my second company. Um, but what I would say is I was so, so lucky to get into a company with a culture that treats everyone equally. So I could not be where I am today if they didn't do that. I look at where I started from. I was the most, I'm a computer programmer by background. I started as the most junior programmer possible. Now, 11 levels later, I lead globally uh, the engineering and operations area for the Bank of Montreal. Uh, it's pretty amazing to be in a company who will let me do that. I'm 45 years old and they've entrusted me with keeping the bank systems up, which is pretty incredible. Uh, what I would say, though, is although the Bank of Montreal has been amazing in terms of driving me, um, I've also uh, as a woman, you always have to make sure that whoever you work for, they are your best advocates. You know, I've had managers I've loved over the years and I stay with them as long as I can once I've learned enough. And then I typically move on either my choice or the bank's choice. Uh, and sometimes I've had managers that I just haven't gelled with. And in those cases, my goal was always I had to stay with them at least a year, even if it's tough, even if it's not maybe my style. You always learn something from working with someone that's different than you. And so what I would sort of say is uh, whether or not you're a woman or a man and you have obstacles to overcome in your area, uh, never be afraid to ask tough questions. Push something that you believe in. If you believe in it, then go for it. You know, sometimes you win them, sometimes you lose them. But if you don't take a risk, you'll win. You'll lose 100 percent of the time. And, you know, it's uh, someone at the bank actually had this great saying and I loved it. And they said, get a seat at the table. And women, sometimes you got to elbow your way in and you got to get in there, but you got to get in there. And if you can't get a seat at the table, either bring your own chair or make your own table. And, and this is how you have to push those biases. And as much as, don't get me wrong, I've encountered lots of challenges in my career with technology teams and different vendors because it's still a heavy dominated male or organization. But part of that is knowing who you are and going for it. Don't let your gender, your sexual orientation, your gender identity, your disability stop you. This is for you to step into it and it's yours to own. Absolutely, absolutely. Really well said, Angela. Thanks thanks for sharing that. Lynn, how about you? How's the journey for you? 
The journey's been interesting. Um, so I've been, you know, really across three different organizations across the three sectors. But being with BD, I've also been very, very lucky. Um, I joined BD Canada first, uh, now working out of the, the, you know, the corporate office. But when I joined BD Canada, it was uh, led by the general manager was a woman. Uh, there was a very high percentage of women that were on the leadership team itself, which for me, you know, was inspiring, but also um, showed the commitment from the organization that if you have the drive and ambition to do it and take the opportunities and challenges that are presented, you definitely can make your way, you know, up in the organization. BD does, you know, I'm very thankful for working at BD. They do a great job um, talking about diversity, talking about inclusion, um, lots of training around personal biases and helping people understand how you view things. I mean, I have my own biases. They, they come from how you've been raised. They come from the environment you're in. And they change the way you think about things. You know, for me in my career, it's always been about really staying focused. You know, my passion is around delivering against my area of responsibility um, and giving my best every day. Um, you know, having confidence in your own abilities, where you're good, where you need help and finding those mentors that can provide that help, whether they're you know male or female, it's about getting that perspective and people willing to give you the feedback and you being willing to hear the feedback. I think one of the things that you know I've wrestled with over time is, you know, I think women in general, we like to be almost perfect, right? Balancing home, work, I'm super woman, we can get it all done. Um, and when we get some of that negative feedback, sometimes probably nobody's harder on ourselves than our, ourself um, and beating yourself up. I think part of the trick is, you know, think about it, give yourself a break, pick yourself up, get that confidence back and continue moving forward. Um, I think my other one, you know, comment too, is we talk a lot about, you know, the, the challenges with women rising up in technology areas, et cetera. One of the things that I've done is really tried to not focus so much on, I'm not trying to solve the gender gap myself. What I am trying to do is deliver great work, um, show what talent is available if people are willing, um, willing to kind of give women a chance and finding, um, you know, where, what are those obstacles that you need to juggle in your life and figuring out ways to deal with them. You know, be proud of the reality that you're a working mom and you need to juggle home and work life. Don't be hesitant to say that I have to drop off a meeting to go pick up my children. It takes courage to do that, especially when you're uh, on a leadership team that's full of men. Um, and, I, you know, I've, I've experienced that many times you know, earlier in my career, but you just have to make sure that they understand what you're doing and what's important and that you get the job done. So whether I get the job done at five o'clock in the meeting or I'm online at 10 o'clock at night, it doesn't matter. It's about the job um, and why you're there at the table. So I really liked, you know, Angela's comment around, you know, bring your own chair, build your own table, build your own reality. Um, it's true. And really be confident in yourself. I think a lot of women are sometimes hesitant to take that leap. We think we have to know everything before we want to take on a challenging role. You don't. And the secret is nobody knows everything. You just have to have the confidence, take the leap and leverage your support network around you, which I think for women, it's super important. You need to have a personal support network. You need to have a work support network and a peer support network um, to make sure that you can balance everything you're trying to accomplish in your life. Great. Thank you. Great, great inputs there, Lynn. Thank you for sharing that. Stella, your thoughts and your, your journey. Um, so I actually, uh, while I work at HCL and I'm in technology specifically as a result of that, I actually built my career on Wall Street and investment banking. And so I spent over 20 years in New York on Wall Street, <laughs> which isn't the... Uh, which isn't uh, very female friendly. And it's actually quite a male dominated industry. And so, as you can imagine, there's very few, and it's not that different in a lot of ways in terms of at least statistics um, from STEM jobs or, or technology, just very few uh, women role models. Um, I think women as a whole struggle wherever you are um, during certain periods of your life, because we're expected to build you know, these outstanding careers because you went to college and you went to business school and you have all these uh, expectations that people have of you. But at the same time, you're simultaneously building your career. You're expected to have a family and you'll have little kids and you'll have multiple kids. And it's all kind of coming at you, I think, all in the same decade of your life. And so I think that has largely been a 
struggle for most women. And in male and uh, male dominated industries where there are fewer role models and, and certainly uh, more of a struggle with lifestyle and, and the professional demands, um, I do think it's, it's very difficult for women. Um, and so the other point I would make on uh, some of the challenges that I think women have is that you have less access to informal male networking and that there is a informal set of uh, information flow in any organization that women may or may not have access to depending on your approach to things. So I do think that when I look back at my experiences, I think there were three things. One, I've always felt that men were just as important as mentors and uh, people that can help you as you progress in your career. So while we all sought out those women role models, a lot of them, frankly, I didn't find very helpful. They were either too preoccupied with their own careers. Some of them are what I would call gatekeepers, right? They've made it to a certain level and they don't want any other women to get through. So not supportive or helpful. And then you had a certain group of women that were very open and helpful and, and, and wanted to bring that next generation on. And those were the women that you sought out. But I find men to be uh, very important because if you're not in a, a balanced gender uh, organization, they're the ones who are your bosses, the people who sit at the table during comp and promotion. And they're the ones who will ultimately, I think, have an un unusually high impact on your career. And so those were the people that I, I have found to be very helpful in my career. And those are relationships that I nurtured. And so I, I don't want women to forget that because that is just the reality of your environment. The second group I found helpful, and this was really largely, I think, to Lynn's point, which is on mental, mental support. And those were the women um, who were going through some of the same things. And I, I, I don't want to underestimate that. They continue to be my confidants, my advisors, uh, you know, people I go to during difficult times. But, but for me, it was more of an emotional support system. And then the third point being, I focused on measurable results. I think women's Women can get interpreted in different ways depending on uh, communication styles, uh, the way you look, the way you act, the way you dress, all this sort of stuff that's subconscious, but yet very real in a lot of ways. Um, and in my role when I was advising CEOs and boards, you know, you're, you, you really feel that because you're usually the only woman in the room. And I think um, as you progress in your career to focus on measurable and concrete results, things that you can point to and say, this is what I've done. This is what I've achieved. This is the revenue I brought into the firm. Those are all things that really, I think, can support uh, and defend kind of why you should progress where you should be. So those yeah. were kind of the three very, points. Very interesting um, uh, perspective, Stella. Thanks thanks for sharing that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Madam Crombie, any, any thoughts from your end? Yeah, I, I agree with absolutely everything everyone has said. I really like Stella's comments. I called it seek out those r male role models and I call it run with the dogs, right? <laughs> you got to be one of the guys sometimes. I used to joke, what I need is a wife. Uh huh. That's what I need. help me be organized. Just joke with them. Right. But she's absolutely right. Those they are some of the best role models. They want to see you succeed. They want to see the company succeed. And I will say, I think the banks have done a great job promoting. Let's call it diversity because they know that having more diversity equals more success, more profitability, a greater return on ROI. And those things are all really important. They speak to those measurable results that Stellar talked about. Um, my mother taught me very young, very simple. Don't leave your fate in anybody else's hands. If it is to be, it is up to me. That's what she said to me and she was right. Don't let anybody else, Mark, take your course for you. You you, you map out your own destiny and uh, stay true to making things happen on your own. So if it is to be, it is up to me. And then finally on what Stellar said, there, are, those informal networks are so important. We don't even realize how subconscious they are. But for instance, men promote themselves way differently than women do. You go into a, a performance review, you go in all well prepared, you know, well, I did this, but I know I didn't do that. And, you know, and oh, I'd be so grateful for my 2% increase. Thanks so much. What do the guys do? I did this and this and this. And they take credit for everybody else's work. Never mind just their own. They tell they tell their boss they need to be promoted and they need 10% or the next level category. We don't do that. 
ladies, we don't do that. And then they have those informal networks on Saturdays called the golf course, where they also equally take eight hours of time to self-promote or after work. I don't know what you do after work. I go, I go home, help my kids get organized, start the dinner, do some laundry, help with the homework, put them to bed and then go back and do work. What do they do? Honey, I'm going to catch up with a buddy. We're going to go grab a beer. Oh, we've got tickets for the Leafs game. I'll see you later. Right? We don't do that. We don't do that. Hey, honey, where are you going with those golf clubs? It's Saturday. We got kids to run around to different activities, right? So there are those informal networks. We don't, we just take it as our responsibility. Sometimes the guys don't, right? That's not their responsibility. Um, with respect to women in politics as well, I mean, I've been blessed. We've got great women at the city. Um, um, I got five out of six women in my office are, are, are women. Um, let's see. Uh, my city solicitor is a woman, my director of economic development, and we have 11 of our senior leaders uh, are women. Our fire chief is a woman. That's pretty cool. Our clerk, our commissioner of community services, which makes it 20% of our commissioners are women. <clears throat> uh, library services, HR, parks, and, and, and forestry. Um, so many, in, oh, in engineering services, so many. Trillium Health Partners, led by a woman. The, Trillium Health Partners Foundation led by women. So we have a lot of strong women. And I think Hazel really um, blazed that path, you know, making it a meritocracy. If you do well, you do your homework, you'll get noticed. Um, and I think that when you present women for public office, people do vote for them. They want to elect women. I think they trust women. Uh, we can raise our families, you know, we, uh, we can manage manage our ridings, our cities, etc. They find women less corruptible if you check the polling, right? Nobody wants to embarrass their children for God's sakes. We are we have high moral principles and we're we're not corruptible and uh, we are very electable and people do trust women once we get elected. The problem with 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 that is that often political parties don't allow women to run in winnable ridings, right? That's the, they, you know, they present a slate of candidates and it sounds great when they have, you know, 60% women or 50% women candidates, but those women are often not put in very winnable places. So that's the difference. So those are my comments on those subjects. I, I agree with everything that's been said. You know, we're still burdening more than our share of family how homes and parents as well, parents and juggling it all as well as our careers. Thank you. Uh, sorry, a lot of thoughts we got right now, uh, you know, coming in from all of us who are more experienced, have seen many, many years of both corporate life and also, you know, family life. What would your thoughts be or, or what is it that we could do, uh, you know, as women leaders, uh, you know, to, to kind of push through more hope, inspiration amongst young girls that there is a bright future for women going forward. And then what are you doing at the city level maybe to kind of, uh, you know, promote that? <clears throat> you know, we try, we all try to mentor women when it happens. I just like to create a, an environment around me that's fair and equal in the meritocracy. And then we, it's fair and equal for everyone. And that's why I think you see so many women in, in uh, leadership roles at the city. And my, my former city manager was a woman. She's just uh, actually she's moved on to take over the region of Peel as their chief administrative officer. And now we have a man, but we have so many women in leadership positions. So I think when you create a level playing field, uh, mm -hmm. women do rise. Um, and mentoring women is, is important. Uh, of course, you need to encourage them. I think you need to tell your daughters how smart they are before how beautiful they are, right? That sort of thing. Uh, I'll leave it there. I know the others will have some comments. And I always get the, seem to get the more airtime, so I'll, I'll give the others an opportunity. Right. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Angela, what, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, who's been your inspiration through the years? And then do you see a change in who you would call your inspiration in the last decade or so as you moved through your uh, career path, as you moved through your personal life? Yeah, absolutely. So if, if I look at 10 or even 20 years ago, I would hands down always say Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and why I say that is I love Oprah. And, you know, I know anytime you say that, some people love it. And some people give me this nasty look because I get people have different opinions. But the reason why I've always loved Oprah is she had a really hard life and she broke the barriers. 
to get where she is as a woman and a black woman in an American society where there's been historically a lot of background of racism is actually, to me, it's just incredible. And so I look at her obstacle she's broken and, her, and although when you're younger, you focus on power and money too. So if you asked me 10 years ago, I would have absolutely hands down said Oprah Winfrey. Um, if you asked me today, I'd actually say the same thing as Mother Crombie, it's my mom. So you look at, so when you're young, it's power and prestige and success. When you're older, you just become more mature and realize how hard life can truly be and what, what your mother sacrificed for you and what they really set you up for success. Like I had a mom who she thinks today I can do anything in the world. She thinks I could run for president. I'm quite sure of that. And, you know, my mom taught me that a human was a human. And even though we all have differences in life, having those core values of integrity and honesty and treating people with respect like you want to be treated, uh, that's worth your weight in gold. And so part of that becomes, you know, my, my ask would be to the people, when you, when you reflect on this yourself, think about who inspires you today versus the past. And I, and I think you'll quickly see it often maps back to your values and just really the struggles you've seen people go through in life. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, as you build perspectives, you change your thoughts. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Angela. Uh, Lynn, my, my question to you is, you know, you've kind of been in the technology domain for many, many years. Have you seen the corporate world uh, change for technology leaders, especially women technology leaders? And, and, and you know, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Um, yeah, I would say definitely I have seen the change start. It's it's slow, though. It's like what I would call a slow roll. So if I look back in earlier in my career and thinking about who was sitting around the table with me or who I was looking up at uh, in the technology space on the leadership team, there, there, there was not a lot of women there. And there were not a lot of women coming in, you know, in the lower ranks as well. It was still very male dominated, um, very, you know, technically focused. But I would say that I feel over the last eight to 10 years, you know, I'm starting to see the lever shift. So we're recruiting, you know, women at a younger ages, targeting, you know, intern programs, et cetera. And we're starting to see the younger women take on some of those really technical roles. And we're also seeing a lot of women coming in from some other traditional areas like finance or HR, where they're starting to bring in um, you know, the softer skill sets around leadership and how to motivate and build teams. Um, Cause you can have, a lot, you know, very strong technical team under you. But what's really drives the success is making sure you have someone that can motivate, bring to life a strategy and know how to really motivate individuals differently. And I think, you know, women in general tend to be a little more in tune with what's going on with people and their feelings and sensing and figuring out how to bring out the best. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, lots of men that are good at doing that too. I want to make sure we're not saying that men aren't good at that. I've actually had some great, you know, male leaders that have taught me some of those skills. And I've had some, you know, interesting, um, I would say, uh, conversations and experiences with women leaders who I didn't think they did so well either. So I think it goes both ways. But from a technology perspective, I think it's coming in now. I think young girls going through school, I think the doors are wide open for them. I think a lot of parents are spending a lot of time now, you know, telling them to uh, Bonnie's point, you're smart, the door's there, it's there for you to take. Um, and I think we just need to keep encouraging our, our young, you know, women that as they're entering into their career to make sure that they're taking those chances and breaking down those barriers and feel like they have a support network around them. Um, so I, I look forward to, uh, you know, looking ahead in the next five to six years. I've seen a lot of, you know, women in my peer groups, you know, here when we talk about HCL, who I work with a lot and a lot of my other vendor partners, there's a lot of other women that are rising up in the ranks. I still think we've got a little more to go to see them up at the very top corporate level, it's still very male dominated, but I think the doors are opening and people are getting some chances now, which is great to see. And we just need to keep encouraging that. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Great points there. Thanks, yep. thanks for sharing that, Lynn. Uh, yep. Stella, you were just sharing with us uh, a while back. You know the importance uh, men play in uh, you know mentoring women. Uh, what would be your advice uh, to your male colleagues on, or even younger, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, men in the in, in the corporates? On what would be your advice for them to really encourage more women to take up leadership roles? How can they support from their end? What would be your overall advice be? So I, 
I believe that any manager of people uh, to, in order to increase diversity and inclusion need to take ownership of those people's careers. And if you can't take ownership of them uh, for whatever reason, maybe you don't think they're capable or you don't think they're in the right fit, et cetera, that they, that they should be placed in positions that will allow them success. So I think as a manager, that's one of the primary roles. And it's not really gender specific, even if you had a male male uh, person reporting into you in that kind of capacity, you would find other things for them to do. Now on the assumption that you have a high quality, highly capable woman on your team, I think any manager needs to really have that ownership. And I, I've actually talked about this with our chief HR officer, because my view, have, having spent so many years in really um, an aggressive industry, is that until managers have compensation and promotion directly tied to the increase in diversity and inclusion, however you define it for your organization, it's hard to measure results. I think that if it's a lot of talk and a lot of fluffy bubble chart slides and you know, once a year, twice a year, four times a year to the board, you, you speak about this, it's difficult, difficult to make significant progress. And so I'm always of the view that you need to tie managers' career progressions and or compensation to uh, increase levels of diversity and inclusion from that perspective. So. That's an overall, I think, uh, executive management uh, point, but I do think that is how you, I think, make the fastest amount of progress. As to people who are, uh, like I said, taking that ownership over that person's career is to flex their power to make sure that that person's experience uh, and or emotional support or the opportunities that present themselves uh, in whatever context of your role is afforded to that person because, you know, and I, I was talking to someone saying women never want to take an opportunity um, unless they're a hundred percent sure that they can do the job. And I think men, they could be 40% sure. They're like, I'll do it. And I'll tell you, like those women need to be pushed when they're at 60, 80% surety to just take the step and do it. Cause I'll tell you most of the time they do a better job than the men. So I think that managers need to take ownership, but also give those women that shove to that next role, to that next responsibility, uh, to whatever it is, and then to be accountable for that person's performance. So I had this one instance where uh, the division head and my investment banker said to this male manager, if she doesn't get promoted this year, it's on your head and you need to come to me and explain to me why. <laughs> and I think that having that kind of a directive really i think sets the framework for that manager and so whether you do it or you do it on your own or you have that mentality i think that's the type of ownership that really is important and i think for women in particular to seek that type of Sorry, while we while we wait for Stella to join back, I think we'll get into our next segment. I know we're kind of running short of time here, so I'll quickly run into our next segment, which is really to hear each of your choose to challenge story. So, uh, Meg Crombie, what is your choose to challenge story? If you can share with us. Um, so I think uh, given the parameters of the pandemic, uh, we talk about choosing to challenge other levels of government <laughs> for equity, for Peel, for Mississauga. You know, uh, I was desperately trying to get us into the red zone two weeks ago, but we were held back because one of the other neighboring municipalities wasn't ready. That wasn't fair. I was trying to create a level playing field for our small businesses. And I said, if you're going to keep the big box open, they shouldn't be able to sell the non-essential items either if our local retailers can't. So those were two. Um, we've been saying the only way we're going to get through this pandemic and ensure that people who, uh, well, they're you know, out, usually hourly wage workers uh, stay home and uh, isolate and recover as if we ensure that they have sick leave and sick pay benefits. And we are challenging other levels of government to provide those because they're they claim they are not real. They claim they're there, but they are not there because you can't take three days off to wait for your test result and be paid to do it. 
uh, you know, by the time you would have to apply while you're sick and you would be earning less than minimum wage. And certainly our factory workers, some of them are earning much more than that. So we know that 25% uh, of workers in our manufacturing, in our food processing, in our warehousing were going to work symptomatic with COVID because they couldn't trade off the paycheck and stay home and recover. They needed to put food on the table. We also know that one, 80 of them, of the of the 8,000, 1%, went to work with a positive COVID test. So sick pay became so important. We challenged other levels of government. And now it's share of the vaccines. You know, they're allocating vaccine based on population numbers. And I, I've been saying, you know, unless we fix it here in the most densely populated areas uh, where the virus is spreading faster than anywhere else, we are the hot zones. We've been in in Toronto and Peel, we've been in lockdown for over four months. And before that, we were had, you know, severe restrictions. It's been almost six months before since you've been able to eat, dine in a restaurant in our areas. It's been pretty severe. So if you don't target our areas with additional vaccine to get people vaccinated, we are not going to recover. And the rest of the province will not recover at the same rate. You need to address it here. For instance, the pharmacy pilot you see in Toronto, people lining up to get their, they make their appointment, they got their pharmacy, their um, vaccine from a pharmacy Toronto had that, uh, were part of the pilot, as was Windsor and Kingston. Kingston's green. There are no COVID cases there. Why wouldn't Peel have gotten our share of the pharmacy pilot? We were getting, and those areas were giving 55,000 doses. We participated in the primary care provider pilot, which gave us under 5,000 additional doses. So there was something wrong. So my challenge was to pushing other levels of government to do the right thing uh, for our residents. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Great, great initiatives under Choose to Challenge. Thank you. Uh, Angela, what, what is your Choose to Challenge story, if you can share that with us? I would say my Choose to Challenge story is pushing the envelope in all technology areas that regardless of your level or your seniority or the hierarchy, it doesn't matter who's speaking. We need to listen with respect. And again, it could be woman, it could be disability, it could be a color of a skin. What does that mean to us in terms of uh, leveling the playing field that we're all humans? So choose to challenge for me, although we celebrate women, we celebrate International Women's Day. It's about leveling the playing field for all and making this an equitable environment that everybody can have their voice. Sure, thanks for sharing that Angela, very powerful, thank you. Lynn, how about you? Let's hear from you, your choose to challenge story. <laughs> My choose to challenge story is actually very similar to Angela, so I think you know, mine is choose to challenge uh, the stereotypes and make sure that we're looking across, you know, organizations and looking at people um, rather than while I support celebrating women, I do similar to what Angela said, I want to make sure we're just looking at people and what they can bring to the table and recognizing all of their different unique experiences and making sure they're heard and providing them the support that they need. Um, so that, that just comes from a personal uh, perspective around you know, having different experiences in my life and seeing where people have not been heard, have probably been a little bit, you know, I would say oppressed or held back um, and not given the opportunity. So for me, that's a personal passion is helping those around me kind of aspire up. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for sharing. Stella, what about you? Your choose to challenge story <laughs> or sharing? I think your choose to challenge is, um, just trying to promote these women on your teams where you have direct responsibility for these people to give them clear and honest feedback and to be supportive emotionally because they do need, I think, more support than um, in certain you know, cases and certainly during certain parts of their life uh, lifetime to provide that and to really make sure there's a little bit more handholding during, I think, key events as people go through their lives. I always felt women in particular, uh, whether it's a new job or uh, marriage or divorce in some cases, or every time there's a childbirth, I do think it's not just women, but men and men as well have these decision points in their lives where they reevaluate and they reassess and they kind of do the cost benefit analysis of keeping going where they are. And I think to be particularly sensitive to those times in people's lives. And for that, you need to actually know the people that work for you and also 
provide that extra extra care. And I think if we can kind of all challenge ourselves to be there for people during those special uh, big moments in their lives, I think we can retain a lot more of these people too. Great, thank you so much. I, I wish we had another 60 minutes because this conversation is just getting more interesting with every question. So thank you so much, but I'm gonna hand it back to our moderator and request her to take some questions uh, from the audience. I know we just we are kind of past a minute of our time, but maybe just request a couple of extra minutes from each of you. Uh, let's let's look at some questions from the audience. So Apurva, over to you. Thank you, Neha. Uh, so the first question that we have from audience today is for Angela. What would be that one thing or decision that you would like to change and could have a different trajectory in your career? <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm not sure I'd change any decisions because I'll say the scars on my back got me to where I am today. I would say I would change how I look at life probably if I knew then what I knew now. So I always thought the definition of success for me was being the most amazing mom and being always there and being the most amazing executive. And I wanted it all. Um, I would say my my process of going through what all means and what success means for me has really evolved. If I knew then what I knew now, I probably would have taken a bit more time to do a bit more self-reflection, figuring out what work-life balance means to me, uh, figuring out what truly success means, because I think that's, uh, to me, that's important as a human. At the end of the day, you still you look yourself in the mirror. And so part of that becomes, you know, where do you want to be and what, what what's important to you in your life? And people often look at a career ladder. So a ladder is going up and you have more power and you have money and all these things. Think of it as a lattice where there's different opportunities and different challenges. Uh, challenges drive me, not money and promotions. So I always, whenever I pursued a different change, it was always because either I was bored or I needed something different to tackle. And so that's always been helping me throughout my career. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. The next question from the audience is for Mayor Crombie. How does your vision and mission for Mississauga tie into the International Women's Day theme that is choose to challenge? Well, I, I described that a little bit earlier when I talked about the challenges of COVID. Um, for me, the greatest challenge uh, with being mayor is balancing uh, our, our revenues, our taxpayer dollars, your money <laughs> with everything we want to accomplish. And of course, everybody always wants more programs, more services, but doesn't want to pay any more for them. So we have to find that delicate balance where we don't raise your taxes more than the, more than the uh, rate of inflation. However, we continue to provide you with great programs and services. And of course, we're building an amazing world class city with two new communities communities on the waterfront, uh, a downtown that will rival any other that is going to be kind of a, a very urban space with lots of towers. We're building in public transit and, you know, we've, uh, we're building in additional public transit, not only the LRT. So those challenges are very real on how we accomplish building a 21st century city with 19th century tools where municipalities in, in Canada, uh, the only source of revenue we have are, are property tax and really how fair is that to tax your home more and more each year and why don't cities have other revenue tools the city of Toronto does have other revenue tools but the other cities do not we do not uh, like uh, land transfer tax vehicle registration tax hotel tax parking tax etc uh, different uh, financing schemes like TIFs and TEGS as well that we don't have and maybe the federal government should really look at a share of the income tax being fairly distributed among three levels of government rather than just two. So lots of interesting challenges with managing purse springs. And of course, we're the only level of government that is not permitted to run a deficit. I don't know if you knew that. We always have to have balanced books, always. So this year has been particularly challenging because of course revenue from transit died. Uh, nobody took a bus <laughs> and uh, we shuttered our, our recreation centers, our community centers, we weren't running programs, our cultural centers. We're the only level of government that laid off people and froze our uh, discretionary spending and froze our wages, et cetera. We're the only level of government to have done that. So, you know, it's been a very challenging year all around, but we tr continue to try to build a world-class city uh, with the kinds of revenue that we do have and, uh, you know, do the best for our residents. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mayor Crombie, for sharing that. 
the next question that we have from the audience is what will be the biggest challenge for the next generation of female leaders i request uh, stella or lynn to take that question please i i i don't know i i think that the challenges in some ways remain the same um i think the if anything i feel very hopeful and optimistic for the next generation of women leaders i think that the pandemic has really taught us that you can have flexibility in your life and in your work uh work styles and in organizations that we probably a year ago couldn't have imagined uh, such a predominant acceptance of it. Um, I also feel that our women in this next generation are less encumbered in some ways by stereotypes and preconceived notions as maybe our generation has. And I'm very hopeful that that will lead the way with a more equitable spread of um, roles and jobs and positions. Um, and I think that there's progress being made on support systems. So in a lot of ways, I feel that this, my daughter's generation certainly uh, will be in a much better place. And they'll have a group of moms who can provide that emotional support, having gone through the ringer ourselves, uh, to give context and perspective. Um, I think from a career standpoint, I do think women need to spend more time in the STEM industries. Uh, I do think technology, uh, as I see, you know, I've, I've probably over the past nine months evaluated 300 opportunities. I think technologies and startups and new businesses continue to lead the way in innovation um, and will drive a lot of the growth in the industry. And I do think that women, uh, no matter what you ultimately end up doing, whether it's consulting or business or academics, like all of that will get in some way touched and influenced by technology. And so uh, I think the challenge is to remain educated and cutting edge and really on top of all the progress being made on several of these fronts. And these are challenges that are facing companies today uh, across the board. Um, and I know those are decisions that people are making in everyday decision making as well as I'm sure in government uh, for Mayor Combi. So those are, that's kind of what I view as uh, some of the challenges and, and trying to stay abreast of all that so that um, that you can you know really be prepared. And I, I do, like I said, believe that the future is bright uh, for many of the women, um, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Uh, the last question that we can take up right now from the audience would be, uh, what is some of the advice that you can share with young women entering a male-dominated profession? Uh, Lynn, I'll request you to take the Sure. Um, so I think, you know, many things that we've already talked about throughout uh, the conversation today, I would say, um, you know, making sure that you have what Stella just referred to, have that strong support network, but start early. So as you're starting your career, start looking up into your organization, maybe what are some of those peer groups that are outside where you can start to network and understand challenges that others have gone through. Uh, but get that support network, find those managers in the organization that are going to be your advocates. Um, I think this has been mentioned several times, right? You have to have somebody that's going to speak on your behalf if they've got the seat at the table and you're trying to get into the table. Um, having you know someone advocate for you and saying, hey, I heard Lynn talk about this or I think Lynn has the right skill sets. Why are you not pushing? Those are very critical things that I really didn't spend a lot of time. I don't know about everybody else on the panel, but when I was young in my career, didn't spend a lot of time. I thought I knew it all and I could just, you know, push my way through. But reflecting back, you realize you need to have people um, that are helping you. I'm hopeful as well. Um, you know, I just want to add on to the last question around, you know, making those changes. I do start to see with everything that's going on in the world today and people recognizing, uh, you know, diversity of thought, you have to, you know, take a look at removing some of your biases and equality. I think we're starting to see, you know, men starting to think differently about women being in careers, about, you know, different thoughts and points of view, their roles, even uh, being more involved in family rearing, that it shouldn't just be left to the, the women, that they have to play an active role. And I think as we start to see more of that, 
we're going to start to see, you know, women having more opportunities to really dive into their career early, still making choices along the way, but they'll have, you know, a different level of support, um, which will help, you know, others uh, start to um, mature faster and start really, you know, changing, I think, the, the what we see in the workforce today overall. Great. Thank you. Thank you so yep. much, uh, Lynn. And uh, I want to thank uh, each of our panelists today for sparing time and being here with us. Uh, your stories, your sharing experiences, uh, and your thought-provoking comments, I think, uh, will really, uh, you know, have a long-lasting impression on everyone who's attended the session today. So thank you so very much. And looking forward to keeping this engagement going and keeping this learning going for our audience. So, so thank you once again to each one of you for your time today. Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, bye, everyone. <laughs>